Like dissolves like is an expression that describes the solubility behavior of polar and nonpolar substances, and if you're a chemistry student, you've probably heard it before. A polar solute will dissolve in a polar solvent. A nonpolar solute will dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. But if the solute and solvent are significantly different in terms of polarity, one's polar and the other's nonpolar, as it is the case here with oil and water, then the components do not mix together to form a solution. Why do you think this is the case? Saying like dissolves like doesn't really explain anything, it's just a decree, it's just a general description of what's going on, but with no explanation of the underlying scientific principles that govern the solubility behavior of nonpolar and polar substances. In order to unpack this, we need to understand a concept called entropy. Entropy is a thermodynamic property that is associated with disorder, randomness, and energy dispersal. And entropy is actually the driving force behind all physical and chemical change. You see, nature tends to change in a way such that energy is randomized to the greatest degrees possible. And this is summarized in the second law of thermodynamics, which states that for any spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe increases. Consider what happens when you drop an ice cube in water. Energy spontaneously flows from the water to the ice, which makes the ice warmer and the water colder, until eventually the ice melts. What if energy flowed in the opposite direction? What if, when you dropped an ice cube in water, the energy spontaneously flowed the other way, from the ice to the water, making the water warmer and the ice colder? That'll never happen because energy does not concentrate. Energy tends to spread out. It's driven by entropy. So it's the tendency of energy to spread out to the greatest extent possible whenever it's not restricted from doing so, which is what causes substances to mix together and solutions to form. So we might expect then, based on our understanding of entropy, that all substances should mix together to form solutions regardless of whether they're polar or nonpolar, which is obviously uh, not the case here when we attempt to mix oil and water. In order to understand why polar and nonpolar substances don't mix, we need to understand the effect of intermolecular forces, which are attractive forces between molecules in a solid or liquid. There are four main types of intermolecular forces. There are dispersion forces, which are caused by random fluctuations in electron density in a molecule. There are dipole-dipole forces, which are caused by the partial positive end of one polar molecule being attracted to the partial negative end of a neighboring polar molecule. There's hydrogen bonding, which is a type of super dipole-dipole force and exists between molecules containing hydrogen chemically bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And then we have ion-dipole forces, which are attractions between a charged ion and the partially charged end of a polar molecule. Here we have the four types of intermolecular forces arranged in order of increasing strength. Ion-dipole forces are the strongest and dispersion forces are the weakest. Notice that between nonpolar molecules, the strongest possible attractions are dispersion forces, which are relatively weak. Polar molecules, however, may experience dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen bonding, or ion-dipole forces, depending on the exact nature of the molecules. Now, it's important to understand what I mean when I say that an intermolecular force is strong or weak. A strong intermolecular force, like a hydrogen bond or an ion-dipole force, requires a lot of energy to break that attraction and a lot of energy is released when that attraction forms. A weak intermolecular force, like a dispersion force, by contrast requires a small amount of energy to break that attraction, and a small amount of energy is released when that attractive force forms. Notice that when an intermolecular force breaks, that requires energy, and when an intermolecular force forms, energy is released. Keep that in mind, because it'll be important going forward. When a solute is added to a solvent, there are three types of intermolecular forces present. There are attractions between solvent particles themselves, we call these the solvent-solvent interactions. There are also attractions between the solute particles themselves, which we call the solute-solute interactions. And there are also attractions between solvent and solute particles, which we call the solvent-solute interactions. Whether or not a solution will form depends on the strength of the solvent-solute interactions compared to the strength of the solvent-solvent and solute-solute interactions. If the solvent-solute interactions are stronger than or comparable to the solute-solute and solvent-solvent interactions, then the solute will dissolve in the solvent and a solution will form. For instance, suppose you add a small amount of sodium chloride to a container of water. 
In order for a solution to form, the ionic bonds between the sodium and chloride ions must be broken, which requires energy. Some of the hydrogen bonds between water molecules must also be broken, which also requires energy. But in this case, the solvent-solute interactions are ion-dipole forces, which are relatively strong, and release a large amount of energy when they form. Since the amount of energy released when those ion-dipole forces form is comparable to the amount of energy required to break the ionic bonds in sodium chloride and to break some of those hydrogen bonds between those water molecules, sodium chloride tends to dissolve in water to a fairly large extent. Let's consider what happens when you add some hexane to a sample of octane, both of which are nonpolar. For a solution to form, the weak dispersion forces between the hexane molecules must be broken, which requires a small amount of energy. The dispersion forces between some of the octane molecules must also be broken, which also requires a small amount of energy. The solvent-solute interactions between octane and hexane molecules are also dispersion forces, which are weak and release a small amount of energy when they're formed. In this case, the hexane dissolves in the octane and a solution is formed. And that's because the amount of energy lost due to breaking the weak dispersion forces between the hexane molecules themselves and the octane molecules themselves is very, very close and comparable to the amount of energy gained when new dispersion forces form between octane and hexane molecules. The solvent-solute interactions are comparable in strength to the solvent-solvent and solute-solute interactions, so a solution forms. Now let's consider adding some hexane, which is nonpolar, to water, which is polar. The solvent-solvent interactions in this case are hydrogen bonds between water molecules, which are strong and require a lot of energy to break. The solute-solute interactions are dispersion forces between those hexane molecules, which are weak and require very little energy to break. The solvent-solute interactions in this case are dispersion forces between hexane and water, which are weak and result in a small amount of energy released. Notice that water can form hydrogen bonds with other water molecules, but it can't form hydrogen bonds with hexane. In this case, the hexane will not dissolve because it takes a lot of energy to break up those hydrogen bonds between water molecules, and you don't get much energy back whenever new weak dispersion forces form between hexane and water molecules. In other words, the disparity between the strength of the solvent-solute interactions and the solvent-solvent interactions is too large for a solution to form, even though the tendency to mix together due to entropy is very strong. I should also point out that while it is useful to categorize a solute as either soluble or insoluble in a given solvent, these terms are fairly imprecise because, in reality, solubility is not a black or white dichotomy. Instead, solubility is a continuum in which soluble and insoluble are just the extremes of that continuum. Some solutes are more soluble than others, and even solutes that we consider insoluble still do dissolve to some small extent. That is it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care.